Good morning. It's great to be able to share God's word with you this morning. Before I do, I want to ask you to just enter into a little um, visual demonstration with me. I want you to look for something in your house. Um, I've got a, a mug. Uh, don't You don't have to go far. Something nearby, something that's not too heavy, something that you can normally lift up and carry. Maybe a cushion or a you know, mug, like I said. Maybe take your shoe off and hold that. Anything, you know, something not too heavy. And just take that with me. And uh, this is the problem with not being in church. If we were in church, I could pick on someone, <laughs> get them to do this visual demo, but we're going to all do this together. So hopefully you found something, just something nearby. You haven't got to be elaborate. Just grab it for me and just hold it out. Uh, just, just, just hold it out there for me uh, while I talk to you just for a minute. And uh, let me say, you don't have to do this. It'd be great if you did. And if it gets too much, just put it down, right? I'll, I'll tell you when to put it down, but if you need to put it down early, feel free. As we um, got to the end of uh, December last year, or maybe kind of in the middle of December, I really uh, was thinking about the coming year and I was listening to God and I felt really God say to me that in 2021, especially in this first month at this beginning, I felt God say, son, the oak need encouraging. They need encouraging. That's where we need to focus our time together as a, as a way of encouragement. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you because we have gone through such a tough time, such a tough time for so long, you know, for nine, 10 months. Like, a, you know, we shared this sermon from last week that was nine, 10 months old, but was still just as relevant. It's like we've carried something like this, this mug that I've got here, whatever you've got, we've carried something for a long period of time. It's what doctors call uh, chronic pain. You know, there's a difference between chronic pain and acute pain. Acute pain is that when you hurt yourself, you know, you cut yourself or you get a bruise or, you know, something happens and you maybe <laughs> chop something off, whatever. It's an acute thing that occurs. But chronic pain is something that goes on and on and on. It could be intense, but sometimes it doesn't have to be that intense. It's the long nature of it that makes it chronic. And there's something about carrying something for a long period of time. I don't know about you, my arm's already starting to feel a little bit achy. Because this mug isn't that heavy, but carrying it for a long period of time gets heavy. A good friend spoke to me and um, Karen about this once. He was saying how he didn't really understand this until he had a, a long toothache that went on and on and on and on. He was like, wow, it really gets to you. And there's something about chronic pain that is physiological. You know, really, I mean, for me, man, my arm here is really starting to hurt at the moment. This mug's feeling a bit heavier. Chronic pain affects our body, affects our mind, starts to get to us. Those of you in the church who have got chronic conditions know this, you've lived with this, you know it's like to experience pain, discomfort on a daily basis. It, it has an effect. And all of us right now are going through what I would call chronic pain. Some are also going through acute pain. There are things that have gone on that are just terrible and just break the heart. But on top of that, Underneath that surface, underneath that, for well, my arm's starting to come in now, it's getting so tired. We've been carrying for nine, ten months chronic pain. Pain of isolation, pain of discomfort, pain of lockdown, pain of not being able to see people we love, pain of not being able to gather. We've been carrying chronic pain. You can put this down. The funny thing about chronic pain is even when it stops, it still aches still aches and so I really felt God say there's this thing that we've all been carrying and then on top of that there's acute pain and in that God wants to comfort he wants to bring encouragement so we've got this series God is at work that I'm just starting this week because even in the midst of this chronic pain God is at work we've got four weeks of this this week I want to speak about God is at work comforting us he's at work comforting us comforting us in our pain in our affliction in our suffering it's one of the eternal theological questions of why suffering there's no easy answers for that but there are answers and there's no easy solutions but there are solutions and this morning we're gonna start our series in 2 corinthians chapter 1 if you've got your bible with you open 2 Corinthians chapter 1. That's where all this series is going to be based. 
This series or this yeah, series based on chapter one of 2 Corinthians is worthwhile understanding the context of 2 Corinthians. It's called 2 Corinthians because there's 1 Corinthians. In actual fact, there were three letters. Some maybe debate there might have been four letters to the Corinthians, but we only have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And in between the first letter, 1 Corinthians, and the second letter, Paul visited the Corinthians. Is what he describes as the painful visit. It did not go well. The first letter did not land well with the Corinthian church. When he went to visit them, his encounter with them didn't land well. And it all focused around a disagreement of whether, Paul, do you really have authority? Paul, are you really our apostle? Because there are other people who have come and they look more like apostles than you do. And the big difference was that these other super apostles, they had it all together. They had it all together. They were like the Instagram image of leadership. They had the the money, the power, the status, the charisma. And Paul was one who suffered. And it caused this question, are you really a leader, Paul? Are you really an apostle when you have such a rubbish life, when life is so tough for you? And that's not just an issue for back in the days of the Corinthians. We have it in our churches around us now. Just think of all of the big names. Think of any Christian leader or preacher or famous person. Think of the charisma. Think of how tidy they look and how well presented they look. Think of the Instagram image of them. Think of the house that they might live in, the wealth that they might have accumulated, the status and the, the glossiness of it. How many big name leaders do we follow who are poor, imprisoned, afflicted, Maybe hesitant speakers who don't really that great and have a great presence in the room. That is what Paul was like. And they looked at Paul and said, well, faithful followers of Jesus don't suffer, do they? I mean, we've got to be successful, haven't we? And, And for Paul coming along as someone who did suffer, who endured affliction and hardship, you would think that his word would be less encouraging, but Paul comes along with great encouragement. And his encouragement is not, I'm going to rescue you from your suffering and your struggles. His encouragement is, I want to encourage you while you're in it. And so this passage this morning, I really believe, is meant to encourage us, even as it focuses on suffering. It speaks a lot about God's comfort. Open your Bibles if you haven't already. Let's have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7 says this in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. I often hear Christians and churches talk about it'll be, we need to get back to the early church. We need to be back like it was in the, in the book of Acts, back in the early church. But the early church was tough. It was a tough time to live in. Churches were messy. There was infighting. There were struggles. There was sin. There was difficulties. And on top of that, there was uh, affliction. There was sickness. There was uh, opposition, isolation. And in the midst of all of that context, which Paul is living in and the Corinthians are living in, Paul starts with a really key word. Look at your verse three. The first word says, blessed, blessed. It's not a word that we often use in life. We, us Christians, use it and we primarily use it when we're worshipping This is a passage of worship and praise to God in the midst of struggles and trials. This is a passage of praise. 
<laughs> Paul, how can you be praising God with what you're going through? How can you be encouraging the Corinthians to praise God with all they're going through? And also with this conflict that's going on between you, how can you be praising God, Paul? Well, the outcome of this passage, as we read it, as we grasp it, as it sinks into our heart, the outcome should be an overflow of praise. Paul is telling them, you're not alone. This passage, Paul is saying, you're not alone. I'm suffering too. I know what you're going through. I'm suffering too. But he says, you know, there's comfort. There's good news. He says, just as I have been comforted, I want to comfort you. And so I pray this morning that we're comforted as we study this. So can we stop for a moment and pray? Just open our hearts. We don't want to grasp this in our head. We don't want to get head knowledge. We want in our hearts to receive the comfort of God and to result in an overflow of praise to him. Let's pray. Lord, I want to invite you into our hearts and our rooms and our video service and this moment, wherever we find ourselves, Lord. Lord, may our hearts receive your word this morning. May we receive your comfort. And Lord, may we, like Paul and like the Corinthians, overflow in praise to you, God. Amen. Have a look in this passage with me. I want to show you three sources of comfort in here. The first source of comfort is the comfort of the Father. The comfort of the Father. You know, God the Father is comforting you. I want you to know that. I want you to receive that. I want you to absorb that. I want you to know this morning that God the Father is comforting you. That's what verse 3 tells us. He is the Father of all comfort. The Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort. It all comes from him. That is his character. That is who he is. He is the God of all comfort, the Father of mercy. And I know we don't always feel it the way that we want to, or we don't get it the way that we think it should be there. But I want to tell you with confidence, God the Father is comforting you. The Passion Translation has a lovely way of translating the, the, the fourth verse. It says, He always comes alongside us to comfort us in every suffering. This is a promise. This is a promise of God that in our pain, in our chronic pain, in our suffering, in our struggles, in our trials, in, a, in the major incidents of life and these long-term things that impact us, He is always comforting us. You know, God has not promised that we'll be comfortable. I spoke about that in the Jonah series before Christmas. He has not promised that we'll be comfortable, but He has promised that we will be comforted. Those two things are rock solid in the word of God. There's no promise of our comfort, but there is, uh, of us being comfortable, but there is promise of God's comfort for us. The Bible is full of words of God's comfort. You just, you know, I typed into Google, Bible verses of comfort, an article comes up, 50 verses of comfort. There's more out there. You let the word of God speak to you. God is speaking words of comfort, as a father would. Here I am in a, in a, in a bedroom. These used to be Annabelle and, and Megan's bedroom. And as a father, there were times when I would come in here and they'd be upset. And I would do my best to speak words of comfort. I just get this picture of God holding us right now, wrapping us in his arms. I don't know how you visualize it, you might be a small child you might be a grown adult. Sometimes I hug my children and tell them great things. It doesn't matter what size you are, but God is holding us in his embrace. And it's almost like his mouth is against our ear and he is whispering to us from his word, words of comfort. You know, his word tells us these whispers of God, him whispering comfort. He's saying, for I am with you. Fear not, for I'm with you. I will strengthen you. I'll help you. I'll uphold you with my right hand, he says. 
He's whispering, you are worth so much more to me than the birds of the air. You are precious to me, God is whispering. He's saying, come to me if you're heavy laden, I will give you rest, rest for your soul. He's saying, I'll never leave you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. He's whispering, nothing can separate you from my love, child. You're my child. Nothing can separate you from my love. Give me all your worries for I care for you. Cast them onto me. Trust in me with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in me, he says. Wait on me. Wait on me. You will experience strength and you'll rise up as a wings of eagles. You will fly. Trust in me. As we cry, as tears come down our face, he wipes them and says, I will wipe away every tear. God is speaking words of comfort right into our situation right now from his word and i know that we kind of we want almost like an injection of god's comfort when we are struggling and when we're going through struggles we want it just to kind of all be wiped away but god doesn't do that he walks alongside us and he whispers his word to us and we experience god's comfort slowly that's how that's how this word of God expresses it. In verse 6, it says, which you experience when you patiently endure. We experience God's comfort as we patiently endure. I've known this personally. I think I've told this story before. Maybe not the depths of it. Only, only my closest friends know the depths of this, but I've told you this bit of the story. I remember about nine or ten years ago, I think it was, I, I went through deep, deep pain within me. I was not in a good place. I was struggling inside. Mental health issues, really difficult place. And nothing changed overnight. God didn't zap me overnight, but through patient endurance and through clinging on to his word, I experienced the comfort and the restoration and the healing of God. And I can remember one particular day when it was really hard. I can remember going to work on my commute, which took about an hour. And throughout that whole hour, all I did was speak over and over again, sometimes out loud as I was walking along when no one was around, sometimes in my head, spoke over and over the truth from the Psalms that says God is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those whose spirits are crushed. God is close to the broken heart and he saves those whose spirits are crushed. God is close to the broken heart and he saves those whose spirits are crushed. And I would say this over and over and over again and let God's whisper come over me and let me hear that. And I received God's comfort as I patiently endured. The Father is with us. We are comforted by the Father. And the second comfort is being comforted by the cross. There's comfort at the foot of the cross, even as we look and Jesus crucified, suffering and dying on a cross, there is comfort. And you won't hear many preachers about this. This idea that Paul shares when he says, we are sharing in Christ's suffering. You won't hear many people preach about that even though it is so littered throughout the New Testament, particularly by Paul, particularly by Paul. Paul suffered so much, he seemed to be able to speak about this the most. As a Christian, your afflictions, your hardship, your suffering is not the same as those who are unsaved. As a Christian, when we suffer, we are sharing in Christ's suffering. We're entering into the suffering of Christ. And as we enter into the suffering of Christ, we enter into the comfort of Christ. That's what verse 5 tells us. As we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. There's suffering of the cross. As we think on the cross, as you think of Jesus on the cross, we get that there is suffering. It's an image of suffering. But on the cross, Jesus was comforted as well. I don't know if that surprises you. If that leaves you a bit, what? At the cross, Jesus was comforted too. And I want to take a moment to clear up what I believe is a significant misunderstanding, a misinterpretation of the word of God. Theologians talk about this, and I'm, I'm convinced 
um, with one particular uh, view of this. I think the Bible is really clear. I think we have created a narrative that the Bible doesn't say. We've created a narrative that says Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God forsook him. That's what we tell ourselves. That's what we tell each other. But that's not what's going on. I don't believe that's true. And I don't believe that's what the Bible actually teaches. We hear Jesus cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just like you and I cry, where's God? Where are you, God? What are you up to, God? We cry out, Jesus cries out. He enters into our humanity and feels the same pain and says, God, God, where are you? But he's doing more than that. He's quoting scripture. He's quoting from Psalm 22. So if you've got a Bible with you, get your Bible, turn to Psalm 22. He is quoting scripture from Psalm 22. And he's saying this to all the scribes and the Pharisees who are around him, all the teachers, all those who've crucified him. He cries out from Psalm 22, quoting scripture. Because they, 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 they have to remember scripture, they have to learn it by rote. Because Psalm 22 is the story of the cross. If what Jesus said was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was the only thing about Psalm 22 that was in common, then we could look and say, well, he's just quoting a verse. But he is not. He is not. Have a look in your Bible. Verse 1 and 2 says, my God, this is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. That is the pain of Jesus we're hearing there. The pain that you and I feel as well. He is walking our walk, speaking our words, experiencing what we've experienced. But keep reading Psalm 22. We're not gonna go through all of it, but let me pick up some bits. When we get to verse six, it says, but I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. Isn't that what's going on at the cross? Verse eight says, he trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him for he delights in him. Those are the words that people threw at Jesus on the cross in Psalm 22 verse eight. Get to verse 16 says, for the dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. This passage Jesus is quoting from is telling the story of the crucifixion. Pierced hands, pierced feet, casting lots for his clothing. He is telling them this is what's happening right now. And Psalm 22 continues. Look at verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. You, O oh you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Jesus is continuing to cry out. This is the patient endurance. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we hear one half of the conversation. The father speaks back, my son, my son, I haven't. Because verse 24 in Psalm 22 tells us, for he, this is talking about God, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of, of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. We might sing, the father turns his face away, but Psalm 22, verse 24 says the opposite. He has not hidden his face from him. God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's not going to break that promise to you. He's not going to break that promise to his son. I will not leave you. I will not turn my face away. As we look at the cross and see the suffering of Jesus, we see the comfort of God saying, I'm with you. I won't turn my face away. I am comforting you. And so we not only just get to experience the fact that Christ is suffering and he is comforted, but we get to experience the same comfort. 
through the work of the cross. That's what verse 5 back in our 2 Corinthians passage tells us. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ, so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. It's through Christ, through the work of the cross, we have been saved. We have been redeemed. We've been justified. We've been forgiven. All these wonderful things on the cross. Jesus has made a way to reconcile us to the Father of mercy. The God of all comfort. If it wasn't for the work on the cross, we could not receive comfort. We might be able to look and go, well, bully for you, Jesus, at least you were comforted. But through the work of the cross, we have been reconciled with the Father so we can receive the same comfort from God as Jesus received from God that says, I am with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. I will not turn my face away from you. We are comforted by the Father. We are comforted by the cross. And thirdly, we're comforted by the purpose. This big question, why is there suffering? I'm not going to be able to answer it adequately in this time or maybe even any other time, but I want to tell you something for sure. For sure. There is no pointless suffering. There is no pointless suffering. You know, for you as a believer, a follower of Christ, someone who is called by God and called according to his purposes, all things are working together. All things, all things are working together for good. There is a point, there's no pointless suffering, including affliction. There is no, nothing pointless. God is using all things together. I want you to really look closely at the verses that we've read particularly verse 4, I want you to see some key words in this passage. I'm reading from the ESV. I think it's a great translation. So that's where I'm picking these words from. Have a look at this. Verse 4 says, He comforts us in all our afflictions. If you're an underliner, you might want to underline all. He comforts us in all our afflictions. How many afflictions? All of them. Which ones? All of them. He comforts us in all our afflictions. He has promised that, to comfort in all our afflictions, whatever we go through, all of them, every single one, all of them, he's promised his comfort. But look what it says. He comforts us in all our afflictions. Here's another underlining bit. So that, so that, so that there is a purpose. There is a point he comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in, get ready, we're underlining, any affliction. He uses our all so that we can be used in any affliction. We think we have to match the pain that I've been through to the pain you've been through, my experience to yours, so that I can comfort you. But God says, all of your pain, all of your suffering, all of the way I've worked through comforting you is useful for any situation someone else is going through. And it kind of leaves you wondering, well, how can that be? If I haven't been through it, how can I comfort someone else? Someone comes to me and they've been given a diagnosis of a terminal illness. How do I comfort them? I've never been through that. I've never been through that. Or someone is sacked from their job for unfairly. I've never been through that. How do I comfort them? Or their partners cheated on them and run off and, and left them on their own. How do I comfort them? I've never been through that. Or they've been bereaved. I've not lost Karen. How do I comfort them? Or they flunked all their exams and their future seems to be disappearing in front of them. I've not been through that experience. How do I comfort them? Well, God's word tells us in verse 4. It says that the comfort that we're bringing is not our experience. It's not our empathy. It's not our, I know what you're going through, I've been there. It's we comfort through the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We comfort with the comfort that God has given us, the deep comfort. And let me be clear, this takes the experiencing of God's comfort. 
This takes the patient endurance. This is not finding someone who's upset and sad and throwing a scripture at them. This is not theory comfort. This is the fact that you have experienced God's comfort in pain and experienced God himself and his son Jesus Christ so that you can share it. We bring the comfort of Jesus Christ himself. I don't know if you realize, but this passage here gives us a window into God's evangelism plan. What does it say in verse six? If we are afflicted, if we're suffering, if we're going through hard times, it's for your comfort and salvation. It's for your salvation. Isn't that amazing? That the pain that I go through God can use to speak salvation to others about the suffering of Christ. The comfort that I experience, God can use for me to tell others about the comfort of Christ. He is using both these things, the suffering and the comfort, both these things for his salvation plan. Your suffering, my suffering is to share and display and show to the world the power of salvation. It's amazing. It gives a different perspective when God is with us in that moment, when we are going through that pain. We see that this is not pointless. There is a point. There is no pointless suffering. God is working. We're tempted to give up. We're tempted to give up when we go through hardship and pain. We're tempted to give up and go, where are you, God? But God says, press on in. Press on in patiently endure this when we patiently endure we experience the comfort of god so don't give up keep going keep going patiently endure open the word of god look for his comfort recite recite scripture over and over again like i said i did find something anchor to it let the peace of god envelop you let his comfort flood over you you know as we let this reality transform our perspective things change. You know, we're all going through chronic pain. Everyone. I'm confident of that. Every one of you watching, we've all been through the last 10 months. And some of you also have these acute pain, these afflictions, these challenges, these grieving, these pain, but they're not in vain. You're not alone. As we cry out to God, and please do cry out to God, as we cry out to God, the Father is here holding us holding us, speaking to us. His word is crying out to us. Don't leave this book shut. Don't leave it. Let his comfort speak to you. Let his comfort speak to you. He is crying out to you. The cross is crying out as we look at the suffering saviour, isolated from his friends, suffering, we see the comfort of God. He is bringing healing, or he brought healing and salvation and redemption and justification and forgiveness. The cross shows us there's no painless, uh, pointless suffering. The cross is the greatest example. There is no pointless suffering in God's plan. There is a purpose. It's the same purpose I spoke about when I was doing the Jonah series, the fourth one. I said how that God is more interested in the salvation of others than you being comfortable. He's more interested in saving people than us not suffering. But he is using this suffering, this chronic pain, even what we've gone through, he is using it to bring comfort, for us to experience that comfort. As we patiently endure as we press in as we let god's word speak to us i pray we get an encounter of god and his comfort that overflows that overflows you know when you experience godly comfort it has to be shared you can't bottle it up you can't bottle up godly comfort who do you know that needs comforting who's hurting your affliction, your suffering does not disqualify you, it equips you. Press in to God's comfort. And as we experience this comfort of God, these promises of God, it changes our perspective and leads us to worship. It leads us to worship that we will be able to say, praise you, God. You are here with me right now. Praise you, God. You have worked through the cross. Praise you, God. You have a purpose and a plan. 
praise you, God. You are seeking and saving the lost. Praise you, God. You are using my affliction and my comfort to bring salvation to others. Praise you, God, the God and the Father of Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort, the one who comforts me in all my afflictions so that I will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which you have comforted me. For as I share abundantly in Jesus' suffering, so through Jesus I share abundantly in his comfort too. If I'm afflicted, it's for the comfort and salvation of others. <laughs> and if I'm comforted, it's for their comfort. The comfort that is experienced as we patiently endure. And my hope for them is unshaken. My hope for you is unshaken. For I know that there is, uh, for I know that as you share in these sufferings, you will also share in the comfort of God. Praise God. 